someone who doesn't love hiking like because I carried a pack too uh, too much. Like, was that the start of your career with Patagonia, or did you work at something before that? I had a camera, but I I never, didn't go to school for it at all, and I just. Thank you guys for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Super Story Time. We're your hosts, Matt and Case and Elliot, and we're the co-founders of Senior Company. It was wild after you said, you're like, yeah, you've had a bunch of my friends on. And then I, after we set this up, I like looked at our cast and I was like, whoa, we have had a lot of people you know on this. And then Barkman's been on a couple of times. Yeah. Um, Daniel Norris. He always just kind of cruises through. Yeah, Daniel. Um, he recently. loves going to Oregon. Do you surf with him up there? Because he goes up, I feel like, once a year to surf. Now I think about yeah, it. Yeah, he comes up to surf. Um, he spends a lot of time. He was, while well, I was building my house, he was up there quite a bit, actually. Um, wow. So, yeah, we, I don't even know how we first met, but. We cross paths. I mean, that crew is tight. That whole, like, every time we go up to slow and we hang out with those kids, we, their network is just insane all over. Yeah. All over. How close are you to the California border? Are you? Um, I'm about five hours north. Um, yeah. uh, Crescent City, I think, is around five. Gotcha. But, yeah, so, but I, that that drive down the 101 is just absolutely. It's insane. It's yeah. insane. I, I almost took the five down this time. I was like, what am I doing? I yeah. Just, I just, it just, it doesn't feel stressful yeah. at all. And, and I haven't done it. I've been to Bend and that's it. What? Oh like, yeah, the, I the, need to do. The Oregon it. coast is like Big Sur, like time. Yeah, a it's thousand. insane. It's like, it is. You probably went through like you know like the Sea Ranch Guadalajara area. Yep. Um, yeah. My girlfriend's parents live there, so oh, no I drive on that the one right there all the time. You know, up to like Modesto and stuff like that. Yeah. Right next to Bohemian Grove, right? Yeah, the Russian River, Bohemian Grove. Um, <laughs> but it is like Big Sur on on steroids because it just keeps going and going. And and I haven't even I haven't gone past the California border, but I'm sure it gets better. Yeah, it. I mean, br- really, you really had just. I mean, one of my favorite areas. I almost moved there, but I just it was too kind of isolated from an international airport. I was Brookings, which is mm-hmm. just across the border, and that that zone is. I mean, the surf's fickle, and it gets really foggy in the summer. It's warmer in the winter, but it's just it's kind of a strange zone. But it's um, there's some of those beautiful scene scenics and like hikes around there. Like, you know, yeah. I'm someone who doesn't love hiking, like, cause I carried a pack too, uh, too much like yeah. uh, for climbing and all photography, mm-hmm. you know, filmmaking stuff. So, but, uh, that area is beautiful. And then, um, I, I camp in the redwoods on the way down. It's usually like the easiest way to do is just kind of like gun it for like Avenue, of the giants area. And that's, um, that area, like is, there's a lot of great little campgrounds. If it's off season, um, just pull in and sleep. And then my friend, I, I've shot for Patagonia for like 23 or four years now. And like my mentor and Jane Sievert, the, who's the previous photo editor, um, she's still there, but not as lead photo editor. Um, she lives, uh, near Eureka and has 20 acres out there. And so I'll just wow. pull in and like Damn, last minute be like, Jane, I'm coming through. Like, <laughs> she's like, Yo, you got a place to stay. No worries. Just nice. cruise through. And so legend. So yeah. I kind of, yeah, I do that. I mean, I was just down here last month for three weeks too. So it's kind of, I do the lap a lot in the winter. So. Are What's you right on the coast? Your career? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I live like I can. I have a like my my view out from most of the house is just down the coastline, and I have just like a few stuff. Haven't seen Huckberry's homes. I have not. Oh, Huckberry's homes. God, no! <laughs> yeah. How dare you? Sound, yeah. Is it what is that? It's beautiful. It's like a Huckberry's homes. It's like cribs, but for cool people. <laughs> <laughs> we should see it. You should have uh, done uh, one of the fridge <laughs> scenes, bro. Like straight out of cribs. <laughs> Sounds insane. What was the uh, drink that was always in it? I forgot. That was like a gimme. Ah, oh, fuck. I haven't seen that show in so long. Did you say, like, get the fuck out of my house? Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that was, that was, a, yeah, it was interesting because I had just kind of finished building a few parts of the house and we worked on it for, like, the last, I mean, it was, it was like a five or six year process total, but, um, but I had just kind of moved in and Scott Ballou did the first, their episode, he was, his was episode one, so at least I got to see what they were up to. And yeah. And I just kind of rolled in. It's like, we <laughs> have a camera crew in your house like just running around when you're kind of settling in but not yeah. really in you know and so well but, why did they reach out to you for that did they know that you were building something or yeah they'd shot they've shot a few things out there um you know with my myself and my previous partner um uh they'd shot out there like a bunch of times so i really like the whole crew over there nice know, the yeah duncan and ben and everybody and alex they're all just they're so chill to work with. So. Nice. Yeah. So, well, going back to your career, when you started, um, you said you've been working with Patagonia for twenty four years. Was that like, was that the start of your career with Patagonia, or did you work at something before that? How'd you get into the Patagonia world? Like, I'm sure. Kind of a convoluted story. I mean, it's I basically was, um, I moved to Oregon twenty five years ago, um, kind of after college, and 
and I got married super young and was in sports medicine. That was my, what my training was, my background was in. And I was teaching climbing at a couple of different gyms and at, at Nike, actually at the old Lance building, Lance Armstrong building. And basically, um, the relationship fell apart. I, I like was trying to figure it out. And right, right when that happened, I bought a camera, um, just a used like film camera. What year um, was this? This is, this is two, end of 2000. Okay. So it was right about when I got Denali too. So that was kind of what, why that's, you know, that, that dog and story meant so yeah. much to me. Cause it was like part, part of the whole of journey, journey yeah. you know? And so essentially like, um, after all that fell apart, I was basically, I had a camera, but I, I didn't, I didn't go to school for it at all. And I just basically was climbing a ton. That was what my passion was. And I got a job at Metolius, this little, um, uh, smaller climbing manufacturer that's, really established over in Bend and, um, basically moved into the, I drove over to Bend to just like work there. And I moved into the back of my Subaru wagon, like an old legacy, like Damn. those things were pr not as tall as the Outbacks or anything. So no. it was like, I lived in there for like a year through a Bend winter and, um, just kind of started shooting. And basically I was, I had access to the photo editors, uh, uh, and marketing director. who's one of my best friends. Like how uh, Brooks and um, I had access to his light table and all the cover letters and all, you know, you get, submissions from everybody and you just i just read the cover letters and was like i was shooting a little bit and i'd throw my slides on his table and he's like i'll keep shooting and uh and uh right. and eventually just published one um and around and around then as i i submitted like i think it was like two sheets of slide i actually found the they used to like photocopy the, the slides they would hold patagonia would and they'd yeah. send you back this letter saying hey we accepted like four slides damn uh, we're holding them in archive yeah they call it the vault. It was really just a file cabinet. But, <laughs> and they say <laughs> name for it though. When they yeah. say accepted, like were you kind of just turning them in for free, or would they pay? Yeah, for so it was kind of like they were unsolicited at first. They they used to just take um, images from anybody. That was kind of how they got their vibe. It was just and Jane curated them and um, and originally it was Jennifer Ridgway who was the photo editor, and she um, hired Jane. And basically, it was just everything about pa Patagonia was the visual image. You know, it was just mm -hmm. like the the gritty, and so. Jane saw something in my work, published a couple images um, back in like, I think it was like 01 or 02. And, and at the same time, Matolius did as well. And so like suddenly I was just like, hey, like the checks was, you know, it was like 1500 bucks when you're living in your car. Like, yeah, huge. You know, you're like, yeah. wow, I could maybe do something with this. Um, and, and, they, and I would just kind of like go on trips and just ask them for some clothes or, you know, sometimes I'd stop. I go down to Bishop and like the east side was one of my favorite places to go and a lot of my early inspiration for photography was that from down that the light and just the and scene down there from especially on the climbing side and i would just drive in i would just drive down on the way there i'd stop at the reno outlet and i just like <laughs> buy like Stock the five dollar like whatever yeah because you know it was just full dirt bag in it and then around then i bought a camper van and that kind of helped extend my my trip for a while and i was doing that for i had no intent to stop um and I was back up in Bend because I, I always kind of, I kept my hub in Bend. I had a P.O. box there, but I really didn't, you know, I climbed at Smith Rock a lot. Um, and we kind of do the West Coast lap, you know, Joshua Tree, Red Rocks, like Bishop, mm -hmm. um, Smith. Yosemite was never really my in my thing because I lived in a van and I had a dog and it was just kind of a pain to be yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, I didn't know anybody that had a house or just kind of like you had to always run from rangers and it wasn't that fun. Um, yeah. And so... And then I would go up to Squamish a lot too, up in BC. Um, so it was kind of like I, a buddy of mine asked if I would stay with him because he'd gone through, he was going through some hard stuff and, and Ben and right, right, right then I'd have been having some symptoms that I was like, I thought, I, you know, something was off. And I basically was staying with this guy when I found out that I had colon cancer and that kind of like shifted everything for a yeah. while. And I like lived in Ben for a minute during all the treatments and everything. And so, wow. but. It was what, like kind of a weird, it was kind of a weird journey. Um, I was in Joshua Tree, actually. It was, I was only 27 when this happened. Um, and I was in Joshua Tree and I was like just hanging out at the fire with a bunch of, you know, climber friends. And I stood up and like fully passed out, like face down. And it was like, oh, I was really? like, oh, I've been eating much meat lately because I didn't have a fridge in my van. So I was like, oh, probably yeah. just like neat, low iron or something like mm -hmm. that. And then that same, like the next day I was like, you know, I was in the, um, pit toilet and was like saw this big like stripe of blood oh, really? like, i was like uh oh like yeah. something's not good and 
a friend of mine, she was like, oh, you should probably go in. You could have, you could have colon cancer. And I looked, I looked up the symptoms and that was like, exactly that. are you over 50? <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. great. You know? And then, then the next, every other symptom I was like, bam, bam, bam. Like I had a lot of like, you know, it was bloating and like, just didn't feel right. And I was yeah. losing energy and also losing a lot of weight. Um, and then also like, because mine was lower, that's like, it was actually like rectal cancer. Um, but which is kind of worse because I guess it has a way bigger recurrence rate. Um, but, um, like you can see the blood and like you can see the narrow like it like yeah. kind of like squeezes it and so it's coming out and like way smaller and i was like no, but really. i ignored it for like a year and a half and it was and mostly just blaming my diet i was like um oh, you know i'm allergic to this or allergic to yeah. that i was like trying to find anything that didn't mean that i was really sick yeah. um and finally i was dating someone who just saw that something was majorly wrong and she kind of tricked me into going in to see this nurse practitioner yeah. and that those two women saved my life because it was getting bad. It was getting really bad. Like I'd be like mountain biking and like I'd just crap my pants. Like I'd just be like, damn. It just because it was like hit a bump and be like, oh, <laughs> you know, it was like All right. it, was, wow. it was getting bad. You know, but yeah. I was like, I just you're like, oh, it was just something I just like, you know, IBS or something. I didn't mm -hmm. know what was going on. And basically, like I went in for, um, for this just checkup, and the nurse practitioner was like, hey, like probably just have hemorrhoids or something. Um. You know, I could give you some anti-inflammatories. It'll probably calm everything down. Um, but let's just get you scoped just to just to be sure. And for someone who was, I was 29 at the time, like like most doctors would just say, "Oh, we're just gonna give you anti-inflammatories. There's no yeah. point in checking you because you're too young." Um, and so that, I mean, that very that that one decision by her, like, is the reason I'm here. Crazy, like, so wild. I would I would have probably been gone by the end of the year. Like, I, it Damn. was it was pretty advanced. And so, yeah. because colon cancer is like. It's like it grows and then it gets in your lymph nodes and it's everywhere. It's just like it goes from stage two to four, like, like. So they just removed so. it, or what's the procedure for that? Yeah, they they removed it. So they immediately started me on radiation, and then I had a, um, I had a pick line in my arm. I wish they just put a port in right away. They did eventually. Um, I had a pick line in my arm, which is basically like a rubber tube that goes in your vein to like protect your veins from the chemo because it's toxic yeah <laughs> um really. and that goes right into your heart and so they gave me this little pump that every like 10 minutes you hear this whir, whir, and it would just be like just dosing you gnarly it's like microdosing chemo um damn that'll toughen you up right there yeah, so crazy. basically they wanted to shrink the tumor uh to make sure it didn't there's all these different ways they go about it but they shrunk it for like i think it was three months of like radiation and like by the end of that it was it you know, it wasn't as bad as the chemo that followed, but it was, it was definitely like, it just started wiping you out and like, you just got to go lay in this room and face down and like, we're getting in the nitty gritty here. Yeah, no, I'm getting <laughs> real. <Yeah. laughs> um, but it's like, a, you're like face down and like, they literally, like your skin can't be touching. So they have to like tape your, tape your butt cheeks apart. Like Damn. The table. And so they get out this big gnarly and like literally like. Talk about vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah vulnerable like, as fuck right there. I, there's, there's this beautiful radiation therapist too. Like, <laughs> oh, like, get the like, hottest like, girl. How's, how's it looking back there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but yeah. she like, I was going in for my first session too, and that because I was so young, the she came running in the radi the radiation radiation oncologist's office and was like, "Listen, like we didn't set this up to protect this guy. He's 29. He might have want to have kids. They were just gonna zap, just like oh, just fuck. hammer me. Yeah. yeah. And so she's like, they had to re redo a bunch of stuff like. Like I had, you know, you have tattoos on your hips, like to like line up with these crosshairs, but they had to realign everything. And like, so I, my legs were like apart so I could put this lead clamshell around my balls. No, wow. like, but they didn't have time to make a fresh one. And so they basically gave me somebody else's that it didn't fit very well. So I'd be sitting there just like face down trying to like put fuck? this like Gnarly. these two things and, and like the uh, radiation therapist would be like, are you, are you done in there yet? And I was like, try. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. It was like Shit. such a weird Gosh. experience. But so they did that and then they like took it out. Um, and because it was so low and already it was affecting everything, like they, they were like, well, you can either, we can reattach you. You're going to lose your capacity to hold it basically. Like you basically are going to eat and just have to go immediately. Gnarly. Which I was like, that doesn't sound fun. But then they're, they're like, and also it's pro it has like a 50% recurrence rate if we don't take out, like give you a colostomy bag. And so I was like, I was like not stoked. You know, I was like elite, you know, like really solid climber at the time. Like just like just an athlete, you know, and like chasing around other athletes and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the surf and the climbing and, I was like, what? I'm going to have this, you know, 
essentially a shit bag hanging from my stomach, you know, like I was like, what, what is it going to be? You know, that's just not, not what I want to do, but I got a bunch of second opinions and realized that it was just, there was really no choice. Wow. Um, and so actually that's how I opened the book was like when I got that like thing was when I went to the ocean, I just dove in and was just like, I just needed to like reset, you know, like, yeah. but I, I, I realized to save my life. I had to do that. And since then, you know, um, and then after that, they basically, they just hammer you with, um, chemo for like, I don't know, four or six months. Um, cause they treated me like I was stage four, but it was, you know, just cause I didn't realize I was like, I was wondering why they're doing it. Like I thought it was just cause I could, I was young. They thought I could handle it. But, yeah. um, I realized now cause I've lost actually Tate McDowell was, he's, he lived, um, in Cardiff. Um, I met him through that cause he had a similar, almost exactly the same stage. We were both stage two, but his came back cause like one rogue cell like cruised up and like, it just like got into his brain and, and the rest of his body and took him. And it was like, I just realized that like they were my oncologist saved my life by like, you know, going hard on yeah. it. So, um, wow. so I lost a few friends that were under 40 to that as well. And so it's just, it's becoming more common. So it's just, I, I don't mind talking about it all yeah. because I'm just like, if it saves someone's life to just go get checked out, yeah. you yeah. know, it matters. And I try to, I try to, um, just be op more open about it. I was like, really like, it's kind of funny because like, you know, having a, I having a colostomy bag, it's like, it's just part of my life now. Um, but it's like something I was really self-conscious about for like a decade. You know, I like, I didn't, couldn't look at myself and see a full human. I was mm -hmm. just like, I was just like, felt like I was missing something. And, but I, you know, the last 10 years or so, I've really gotten more used to it. And I started sharing at once. I like when it was like my cancer anniversary, like five years ago or something, I shared a portrait a photographer took a photo with me with it showing it was the first time I'd ever done that. And I was shirtless and it like was the number of people that wrote me that said that like got their dad or somebody to go in. It was like, okay, I need to like be more of an advocate yeah, and talk about sure. this. For and sure. that's actually the reason I'm down here. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'd just come back from, um, from being, I was down, down this way for like three weeks and I, I went home and, um, messaged this tin type photographer, Joni Sternbach, who I'd, we'd kind of been Instagram friends. She's 70 and, um, she's kind of a legend from New York and Brooklyn and uh, doing the, like the large wet plates, like the 10, 11 by 14, the huge, the huge ones. And, uh, I was like, Hey, like it's, it's coming up on 20 years this year to, you know, from when I got diagnosed, so, like, I'd really love to like, just do a photo of my dog and I like with, you know, and she's like, well, I'm like down here for like two more days. Like if you can like get down here yeah. so, to Santa Barbara. Wow. And so I like, cause she lives in, um, Brooklyn usually. And I was like, I'm not driving Nori out there. I don't, I don't like to fly my dog. So, yeah. um, and I really wanted her in the photo. So we went, I went, I, we went and like last Friday we went and took like a bunch of tin types at, up there and it was just to kind of like commemorate that. And, um, yeah, it was a really cool experience to work with someone. And it turned out yeah. she'd just survived lymphoma. And so it meant a lot to her too. And that was her first time like taking pictures since she'd gotten through all the treatment. So it was, it was a pretty meaningful yeah. experience. So that's special. Wild. Anyway, that was yeah. that was a long diversion. No, <laughs> that's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing all that. Yeah, because it's obviously really impactful yeah. and could yeah. could make like a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. Yeah, and it's yeah. cool to hear your story and like see you now. And I feel like you're still like such an athletic and outgoing guy, and it's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's like I feel like that's the other thing too. Is like all the people that like go through something like that, they kind of just give up, you know. And I'm like, it's I just knew there was no option, you know. I so like just tried really hard not to let it slow me down and yeah got back after it and you know did some of the hardest climbs right after i got back from all the chemo and you know like having a having a you know colostomy bag that there's like adhesive and stuff involved i worked with this company that simon that like makes it so it's like stays on during like sweat and stuff because i do jujitsu and i surf and climb and like you know I, I don't climb as much anymore but yeah it's like keeping up with athletes you gotta like have your systems dialed like yeah. you can't be messing around and i'm really fortunate actually like one last thing on the, on the colostomy it's like i i have my full digestion a lot of people that have like crohn's or other things that have to get their whole colon removed it's like you lose all that absorption and stuff and that that's really hard you know and but i'm fortunate i can give myself a colonic and basically be good for like 24 48 hours and so i don't have like i don't have to like i basically just have to wear a cover because it's like you know sensitive tissue but yeah so it's like i always joke that i probably self-administered like 
about half a million dollars with a colonic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> sitting, yeah. in the, sitting in the jungle, you know, in the <laughs> side of a surf break, like in the yeah. jungle somewhere getting eaten by mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's wild. I mean, that, that definitely adds another level when you're going on, I mean, climbing and surfing and all these missions you've, you've been on yeah, and yeah, doing that yeah, sounds yeah. So, you, so gnarly. Yeah. You got to have everything pretty like dialed and, um, but I'm really aware of what I eat now and everything too. Cause I just, it's just, you're, you're more in, like intimate with what you know, goes in and out of your body. So I realize how important hydration is cause like nothing's going to happen unless you drink water. So yeah. It's like <laughs> wild, but yeah, it's anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah that was there. awesome. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> so was like, did, did you get to Nolly during that period? Like when, do, when you got the, when you got your first camera and you started that process, how old were you again during that? Uh, I was 24, I think, when oh, okay. I got Denali and got my camera. And so it was all right within yeah. that same yeah, so, period. Yeah, and then when the, the marriage ended and everything, I went on the road to Denali. And so he, like, it was like, you know, in the back of the Subaru. Yeah, so you guys <laughs> so, just bonded yeah. immediately. Yeah, and it was just, you know, like, dogs are, they're such good friends when you're going through stuff. And then when I was going through uh, chemo and cancer and everything, like, I mean, they let... I don't think they ever allowed dogs in the hospital, but like my nurses snuck him up and like he was just in the hospital bed with yeah, him. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's really cool. Yeah. And it's funny when the Denali film was coming out, like I needed something that tied, I didn't want to do animations and stuff. It was kind of a simple film and I needed a photo that tied that together and I could not find, I knew, I knew somebody had taken a photo in the hospital, but I didn't, nobody like, cause it was, that was a film camera day. So like, it wasn't like now where everybody's got like a thousand yeah. photos of yeah. everything on their phones you know and um uh my mom just all of a sudden was like what? she goes i didn't take any photos in the hospital it's too miserable experience and i was like oh cool cool and then all of a sudden she just like last minute like was like oh except this perfect yeah, photo that you yeah, needed yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> she just found it one day or i like i think i found a negative out of it and i was like i think you took and my sister took this photo and she's like no i took that photo and i was like well where are the other ones and yeah. you know, she found it all and so Dang. yeah i was kind of hiding in some shoebox somewhere so crazy the same Rocky Mountain water, the same brewing tradition that started in 1873 in Golden, Colorado. Because when you're a favorite beer of rock stars, smugglers, cowboys, and presidents, you don't compromise. That's our legacy. What do you want to go down in history for? Coors Banquet. Start your legacy. Whose idea was it, like from the start to shoot that film? Um, it was it was kind of a strange process because Denali was on his last. You know, I'd already kind of told him it was okay to go because he was on. I knew he was like it was he was older. He was like fourteen, and um, I got this little. It was a really small little um film project with um I think it was Snow Peak. And because they were based in Portland, as one of my friends was their marketing person. So like, she's like, let's do this little film. And so we, I started, that film actually started with, it was like, you know, having like loving the, the you know, everything that I was really sh into shooting music and stuff. So I loved this, you know, Portland scene, but I also wanted to be outside, you know, and like be at the beach and be, and then there was also like, it was more like this duality thing. Like I love being at the crag, but you know, climbing, but then I also need, I need the ocean. I was raised in around water. And so um, that's how it started. And then, um, my friend Skip, while we were, <clears throat> while we were, um, starting to shoot that, um, cause it was this, uh, Skip, um, Armstrong and then this other kid Paige who was working for me at the time. Um, we basically just started filming it and he's like, Hey, Skip's like, Hey, like your dog is getting up there. Let's, let's focus, let's do a little bit of this about your new dog too. And then as we started shooting, it just became more and more about my dog and I, and that was kind of had this whole existential abstract we shot a lot of scenes that never made it um there was a cut made actually um that i kind of um we almost put it into film festivals and then it was just it didn't it just didn't have the depth i wanted and i just like the the meaning that denali had met you know been with me for that long so really it was just to commemorate that relationship and how everything that you know through through divorce and like cancer and like just building a creative career you know like he was there all through that whole process and i mean we lived in a van and a car for like four or five you know four years you know and on the road a lot so um but so 
ended up pulling it from festivals that what the 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 cut that was going to be out and then i tried to edit it. i tried to get in there and edit it but it was too i was too close to it and a few other friends did and then Ben Knight, who ended up narrated it, narrating it um, and editing, I think I gave him director credit, but he like he basically like took all the footage and the previous cut and everything, and kind of um, rewrote it. And there were a lot of things along the way. Um, his partner at the time, Katie, was going through some health stuff, and I think it all kind of just came together. And she's the one who kind of interviewed me, and it just when it when he finally sent the first cut because he's not he's a genius ben is but he's like he's not a very he's not a clap it's somebody i i love sitting in on edits and stuff and he's kind of more of a solo yeah solo editor and kind of goes through that process alone and and so when i got the first cut i knew there was something there and we, we just kind of shuffled a few things around and then it came out at a few film festivals and just kind of blew everybody's mind and i was like huh we might have something here and I think Ben actually said once, I think this is going to break the internet. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, after that, after those film festivals, it was like a little one called Five Point in Carbondale, Colorado. And then I think in Mountain Film, it was, it almost won people's choice there because there's no shorts category. And there were all these like million dollar plus like, you know, docs that, you know, was like right there with. And we made that film for 20 grand. Damn. It was like, it was just purely passion project. A lot of people did work for free or for, I traded prints for them, you know, it was yeah. like a, it was passion project. Um, and, uh, yeah, so then it, it came out or one of my friends there said he was, a, he's a filmmaker, um, who's had, he made that film, the Alpinist that's on Netflix. And, um, he was like, you cheated, you used dogs and cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, well, those both, those both happened. So I didn't manufacture that. But, yeah. But, uh, and then it came out like that June and, it was kind of those like things where all my friends shared it the first day and I was, I was in Portland at the time and I was sleeping on my deck cause it was just so hot. I had, a little, I had this like little, just, I think I had a tent set up on my deck. So I was just like, it was just too hot to sleep yeah. inside. And I remember I had my phone off and I turned it on the second day. The first day was like 5,000 views on, it was on Vimeo too. So it was just kind of like a, just shared it to, and then the second day, literally it went from 5,000 to a million views and I had like, Damn news truck stalking my house whoa and, no way. You know, like, today show was calling and like everybody was like Damn. it was just like this weird it just some mom blog shared it uh -huh. and it and it like that's what and, did it a yeah, mom blog yeah and then like and facebook <laughs> and it was mom blog. yeah what yeah because instagram was barely that was 2015 so instagram was there but not like where people shared stuff really yeah. um it was all it was almost all facebook and like it was so strange it was like yeah and then it just got picked up and then oprah put it on and it was wild it was like i was talking to reporters like all day from all over the world like, what a change of pace was, right there really. and i didn't i you know it was one of those things where i didn't it was just me i didn't have an associate producer or something yeah. to help with distribution or anything. Yeah. it was just like we just i mean film festival started asking for it but it wasn't like a it was a wild experience um but it's you know and because it was on vimeo nobody got paid for the views and it had like um you know licensed music in it and so it wasn't like we could capitalize on that and so it's like probably been seen like 20 25 million times now now or something but it's like that was never it was never anything directly from that yeah um but i knew there was a deeper story there and i wanted to get it down in my own voice and um I, the only person i knew that was published in like our world that was that was an author because i had a lot of publishers and like film studios were reaching out and everything it just felt like it was kind of a the sharks were circling you know and so i wanted to like do something um that meaningful um and uh uh john krakauer i'd met at the mayru screening at like sundance or something and like um we'd been friends on social and stuff but um he he basically kind of he called me and said hey like if you have any interest in writing a book like you at all like this is a rare opportunity to actually do it because like people are actually gonna a publisher will actually do it um, yeah but Damn. there's it's a process and like you just talked to my editor buddy mark bryant who like i think he edited into the wild and like um i think he edited like the perfect storm and stuff like that too like a lot of things that were um around at the time and so and mark used to be an editor for outside and and stuff and so he was kind of knew my world and he just took me under his wing it was like I, the publishing world is weird it's like it's like if you unless you know who to talk to like yeah. get an agent or whatever and so he helped me. He basically like sent out my story to a ton of, a ton of agents and, um, and basically was like vetted them all for me and was like, 
here's one I think you'll appreciate. And it was just, I, I shared, I had this, I have the same agent that Tommy Caldwell had who did the Don Wall. If you saw that yeah. doc, um, I mean, Tommy's been in all, I'll say he's like in free soul and everything too. But, um, so Tommy helped me kind of figure out how in the world to put together a book proposal and all that stuff. And it was, so it was like a lot of people just in helping and then his, his attorney, like contract attorney. And then my, um, who's John, who's crack hours agent. Like she, she also just that she helped him with into the wild and everything so i knew i knew it had potential to be also like a bigger film so i wanted to make sure i had people that you know had people that knew how to like deal with hollywood and everything else yeah. too so becky helped me a lot she's still someone who's ad advising so it's been it's the, the then i wrote the book and the book's been optioned but ironically when i wrote the book i was living in my van again because i had my housing situation at the beach like i just moved to the coast my housing situation fell through, but I just built out this van and I was like, well, I have a piece of property now yeah. here right next to the beach. So I might as well just like park it, park here for a minute. And my folks had just moved out from Michigan and they had like five and a half acres. And so, um, I could kind of like run up there as well. Um, but I ended up writing the book, like sitting at the beach that where Denali kind of had his last days and like I had Nori then too. Yeah, that's so powerful. It was, like it was a lot of like, it was a long process. It, like it was, it was um not easy to like write because i'd never written before <laughs> really yeah. at all but um and i but i knew i needed to go a lot deeper with um than the the short you know because the short's only eight minutes so it's when you but. when you write a book like that do and you send it to the publisher do they um kind of help so do they send it back with like different edits that you should have made or is it kind of just like oh here it is let's run it yeah, honestly, I thought they were gonna get me a co-writer or a ghostwriter. I was like, I've never written anything longer than a longer than a college paper before. Right. You know, I think I'd done one article that was like literally three par paragraphs yeah. long or something. Yeah. I'd never, and so I thought I would just assume. But then Mark helped me develop the the um, book proposal, which needs a sample chapter, it needs a full outline. You got to do this market research. It's like a lot of like you got to have a pretty. It's like. 20,000 words to just put that together so it's Jeez. kind of a, a big chunk of the book um and as I was writing I was like okay are you, are you guys gonna bring in another writer like what are we doing and I was like no you're writing it and I was so, so Penguin basically my agent pitched to Penguin and uh my editor there is amazing he just really wanted me to tell the story in my voice not a lot of people wanted me to do another dog voice story and I was like that's that's been done you know it's like a that's a novel at that point it's not yeah. it's not real right. and so i put a few anecdotes in there but it, it ended up being so it's like a but then every every writer has like your editors are like your best friend you know like that's who really makes it powerful so i hired a, i hired someone in between um uh who knew my story who was like um i did a little film about her like she she kind of helped like me with like some things where i was just wasn't sure i was like hey can you just read this and then my, my, my editor editors of penguin helped me a ton so it was like it's it's a process and it took me a lot longer i lost a few foreign publishers because they were you know they they wanted it sooner but i was like i can't do this until it's done you know yeah so, but yeah wild. it's been a wild process yeah. but it's it got optioned once to be a film um the feature film and like uh it was all set to go and then it was during COVID though. So it was just a weird time with filmmaking and everything. And, um, Charlie Hunnam was like all set to like produce and be it, be the actor from, from Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. Like, that's what I was going to say. I was about to ask who would yeah, play you. Yeah. you know? So Charlie, Charlie, yeah. I still talk to Charlie. He's like, he's, he's great. Like um, the main guy we're talking about. Yeah. That's his name. He looks like yeah. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We kind of look similar. Um, yeah. he was going to do it and Max Winkler was directing it. And that kind of, we had a great crew and it just kind of, it just, the thing about movies is it just takes a long time, you know, like to like figure it all out. And oftentimes the op option expired and um, Spygoss Media had it and they decided not to renew. And so it's kind of out there. And now I've got this team that I'm really, really excited about that I probably shouldn't name any names yet, but um, it's a newer production company with some people that everybody knows. And um, But what I'm really excited about is the writer had a film made about his life that was really really popular that he and he it was not an easy film it was really vulnerable and so like and he lives in Bolinas and has dogs and it's like he's just he gets it he gets it and yeah. stayed, I like when we met we were, I was just like oh dude let's let's do this like it's I really like him so I'm hoping that that official offer will come in, in the next few weeks um, Damn. so it's I'm That's really awesome. excited about it because it's like I really love everybody involved with this time so but Charlie yeah. stay with it or is it something new no Charlie's like he decided like 
he's writing a lot more now and developing shows and he's he's kind of like started to really love like being home to you back in england and stuff mm-hmm. so he's yeah i always laughed because like my friends when he was when charlie was gonna do it they're like well he's got a terrible english accent and i was like dude he's like he's like from the different part of england like, <laughs> like, it's like the viking english you know he's got yeah. the, the more of the gritty not yeah. london, london londoner you know like the geordie english so that cockney shit yeah damn it's good, heavy good stuff yeah, yeah. Damn, that's wild. And I was going to say, too, it's a little bit of a pivot, but I was just curious in terms of wild stories. When we were getting breakfast up in L.A., you were talking about your parents and how they met. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if they know it, and I just thought that would be a fun one to kind of talk about how your parents met. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my parents were, like, super young. They're, my dad was, like, 24, 25. My mom was 19 or 20, and they, they met in, a, like, a cult meeting and got married three weeks later. And then, like, a few weeks later, I, I was conceived. And so I was born when they were just – they literally had to give every all the possessions. It was, it was – the cult's, like – I think it's still around. It's, like, changed names, but it was called Children of God. But it's uh, called, sorry? Children of God. Okay. It's like, it was, like, religious, but, like, kind of, like, in that free love, like, 70s, like, you know, whatever. It's – I don't. I don't. I actually don't know a lot about it other than I was born when they were in it. Do do, the, do your parents did they know it was a cult when they joined it, or is it one of those things where you're like, oh, I we're think, joining this? Cult I think group? everybody. My dad had just gotten out of Vietnam, and it's like it was just everybody's just looking for something. You know, yeah. it was that time. There they are. So what made it a cult though? Um, David Brandt Bird. Yeah. So that was born again hippies. So my oh, parents got out right. Oh, right what? Seventy-seven Huntington Beach. I say no what? It says they gathered at a coffee house in Huntington Beach in Orange County, California. Born again hippies. Is what oh my yeah. god. <laughs> Born again hippies. How does that make any sense? Wait, so were they in? Were they in Huntington? Uh, Wait, uh, they made a movie about this, didn't they? Now it's called The Family, I think. Did they make um, a movie about this with the guy from Frasier? I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? I, Wait, can you search movie? I just saw a trailer. Like there's one Joaquin Phoenix. Is that, Bro, is that one like about it too? Was he in it when he was a kid? No fucking way. This one's in. Oh wait. I actually don't. You, we're finding out more about yeah. it than I do. Like, <laughs> My wife um, loves cults. The pro pedophilia sex cult. Okay, that's not really. <laughs> <Like, gnarly. laughs> <laughs> My parents always say they they didn't see anything horrible go on, and but that's yeah. good. How long were they in it? Yeah, um, they were in it for a couple of years. So I got. I think so they my, saw enough. My sister was born right after they got out so they, we moved my dad's from michigan we moved back to michigan and um they bought like 20 acres way with this uh, and then this other family bought like 40 acres next to them that i mean in the middle of nowhere that like they all, all got out of the cult yeah. together um and yeah so that they got out of it and we were just we lived off the grid for like from the time i was like i don't know i think we couch surf for a while and then i was like from like four to nine age four to nine i was we lived off the grid and just snowmobile oh, yeah. snowmobiled in you know Damn. Kind of the, to this like spot way back in the woods and my dad taught himself how to build a house um so you think you got a lot from that because that's a pretty developmental age like oh, yeah. being outdoors and climbing and all I mean, that stuff. it's like i mean I, I never was exposed to like any of the you know outdoor adventure sports until um until like college but or like actually some of my friends were really into surfing in Michigan, but uh but uh it was like you know, you know pretty much lived off the land. Like, you know, had a, a big huge garden. We had yeah. like a little bit of live you know, like we had a few chickens and pigs and turkeys and we kinda raised all our own food and um my dad, you know, hunted for white tailed deer and like their steelhead in the rivers and Damn. You know, it was like and so we were like just a little inland from Lake Michigan. So most of my like most of my childhood I was um or all the way to college i was in like kind of western michigan Damn. um but yeah then my dad just kind of you know they gave everything they had to this cult and so like my dad really like he kind of just figured out how to do everything he just like was really really resourceful and then he started building log homes for a while and so kind of learned a little bit more about it um but and then just was he just built every house we lived in and so kind of that Damn. taught me a lot about being resourceful and and yeah, wow. honestly, like the when I was in college in sports medicine, I realized it was really similar. Like, when you're on the field, you have all these tools, you know, your your kit, and like somebody's face down and unconscious and bleeding. You got to like, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of like a little paramedic. You know, you got to like figure out what to what to do, like in the moment. And yeah. with a 
football coach screaming at your, you know, <laughs> telling them that your play their player's fine. And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so it's like, you kind of have to just like think on your feet. And then that's really transitioned even in the, you know, filmmaking and photography. And, you know, like the style I've always had is like small crew and pretty scrappy, you know, and it's like, I, I've been on giant sets, but I really, I really prefer when it's like, you know, you're kind of like a little bit more nimble and mm -hmm, kind yeah, of bare and, bones. But then when like everything goes wrong and the client's like, they're watching the monitor and you're like, you have to basically like pivot and pretend that everything's still fine and yeah. I like, can like kind of figure it out. You know, you gotta yeah. like, you gotta figure it all out. And well, you'd love to be on some of our shoots cause ours are always pivoting. <laughs> oh my constantly. God. Yeah. Those are the best. That's how you find the magic though. It's like, honestly, the scripted stuff. And that's how my shit, my shooting always was with Patagonia too. Is like, I was, did more behind the scenes and lifestyle stuff. It was like, I realized the peak moments, you know, were really fleeting and I realized that everything that, the really that what mattered was the culture you know like the the, the community and the hanging out by the fire and the, yeah. all that stuff is what really like was really meaningful and you know it's it's just you know that all all the moments i remember of everything you know like how i first met like jeff johnson and keith malloy and that crew was and and renan oster who's one of my really good friends like um all now are like you know wildly successful at what they do and they were just around a around a campfire like during the bend of baja like we just kind of went did, did this climbing thing together during that 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 trip and i was i was in the middle of chemo but it's like what i think about it often is just like hanging out at camp and like yeah. you know and keith mentioned some you know matt, matt costa and like we had like the one i think matt's very first single and like that led to like him saying that led to us going to a show to like let led me to shooting like when he opened up for jack johnson and then it's Crazy. like it was like this whole all these little moments like all of a sudden led to like you know meeting meeting that whole crew and and shooting music and you know been friends with them you know the malloys for a long time and I, I just listened to the episode with tim lynch and it was just funny to hear all the the tie-ins of totally. all, the, all the boys and um that family and stuff and so but so many of those films that they made um were really meaningful and I was just writing a little piece for Huck Berry about like favorite film. And I was like, those, those films back then, you know, those 16 mil surf films and yeah. how I found music or how, totally. you know, like, and when I was at a benefit auction, when I was going through chemo and Chris sent me like a box of DVDs that was all the old films, you know, and like, um, one of them he wrote, you can do anything on it, which was a line from the film that, uh, Brett Kelly, about, um, when he lost his leg to bone cancer, he like tossed his crutch and like the, well, right before he's going to surfing but it all those like musicians and moments and things all intertwine and like it's just it's crazy how like much how many paths like have converged totally. and like mm -hmm. now that the, how much influence those films still have and like all the people that are i'm super close with now and um yeah it's i never expect to get into filmmaking at all because it was like back then it was like you know it would cost you know to make you know one of those 16 mil films you had to have like a budget for all that film and processing yeah. and you know shooting a bolex and everything it's just it wasn't something approachable until like until digital cameras you know that first that moment where a lot of people s realized they could do it yeah. my first music video was all on handy cams and stuff and hell was, yeah <laughs> that's, that's how sick. i learned we still like to use handy cams every <laughs> once in a while i get yeah. the fun shit uh, with those uh, real quick can you, <clears throat> you guys could hear me now yeah my were you out? Turned off for like ten minutes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that feedback the, we were hearing. Oh right? yeah, mic, should I change my mic? I was wondering why it, the it podcast could... was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting over here. I just couldn't hear Case at all. Yeah, I just, yeah. I just. Oh, are talking you talking? Completely. I did at first, and I looked at Eli, and he's just like, <laughs> like "Oh shit, you're back. back, pivoting, bro. We're I'm pivoting. Yeah, you're back. back. His mic. Oh wow. Oh, should I should I change it out? So it could you. be the cord. We are gonna do it later. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna have to like take out the cord and it's the whole thing. I just know. didn't know what okay. to do. I was just like <laughs> but just just smiling. This is as loud as you can be. This oh. works. This That's works right here. Yeah. We're learning. Hey, perfectly. We're learning. Beautiful. We're learning. It's only our our forty. Do you wanna do the, the Instagram thirty two bit flow? Questions? Yeah, that's uh -oh. here All we right. go. This Segment Segment. Oh shit! Uh oh, I fucked it up. Oh, you right. fucked it up. Oh. oh god! Now we gotta wait it out. It's supposed to be a surprise, anyways. Yeah, yeah. we'll wait it out. No, it's a fun little. It's a fun little spoof thing. You go hit it. Yeah, and, okay. Well, it's gotta finish. You know what yeah, I mean? We don't know. Here we go. Hello. Can I trust you? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's so skeets, dude. <laughs> oh, that's fun. All right. <laughs>
Hit it. First question from Danielle Vigil. What makes Oregon so different from any other United States state? <laughs> um, Oregon's, I think, it, it, it's a really diverse state. A lot of people think of it as this is rainy valley, you know, and it, it's got such so many ecosystems there. Yeah. There's the high desert. There's the um, Wallawa, like the mountains up in the northeast that are completely different than everything else. There's a ton of mountain ranges and rivers everywhere, and it's, there's a lot of, like, open zones there that like the Elvar desert which is kind of like the black rock desert um and then there's the coast as a whole there's the Willamette Valley is that people think of as Oregon is in between the Cascades and the coast range and then but on the other side of the coast range is the you know the coast is a completely different climate it's temperate oftentimes the weather's not much different than down here um we flip-flop rain <laughs> oh, really? it's interesting like when it's pouring down here that whole time you guys were getting like just hammered with yeah. rain we it was sunny and really? offshore no oh, really it was it's just interesting how the weird the just where the um atmospheric river's hitting and the jet stream and everything um but what's really funny about it is like being down here in la um we're not in la right now we're yeah, we're in the cabin. <laughs> we're in the cabin. Yeah. Um, being being down in LA, it's it's really funny. A lot of people are like, "Do you live in like? Are you like next to Alaska?" Like people think Oregon is like oh people that are in the bubble Come of LA, on. like especially East LA. Like, yeah. it's, oh. it's just they just don't understand like geography. How, how close it is. Also, it's a commuter flight. It takes less time to fly back home than it does to drive from here. To LA, LA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. to get here to LAX, it's like the same amount of time it takes to fly down here. Yeah, that's you know, crazy. it's like um, that's sick, honestly. And so a lot of people, you know, go back and forth. And is it pretty rainy? Um, for parts of the year it is, but it's like in the in the Willamette Valley, like it definitely just drizzles, and then it's really hot. It can it's gotten a lot hotter in Portland in the summer. Um, and Bend is Bend is kind of, you know, it's in the high desert. It's not truly a sunny. You know, like it's not like Utah sunny, but it's yeah. it's it's beautiful over there. I lived there for a long time because I was climbing, and but I started missing the missing the ocean. I mean, yeah. we had the ditch wave that used to surf with Jerry Lopez, and mm -hmm. that's how I met Jack Johnson. Actually, was surfing the ditch wave, um, and and uh, but the 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 coast is kind of it, it, the storms blow through are really intense. They're southwesters; they'll blow through hard, and then it's like it'll be it'll be like sunny for a while and we'll get you know last week we had it was 65 70 and and offshore and perfect you know we'll get we'll get a lot of beautiful yeah. weather in the winter so it's, it just depends you know and i live really close to all these beautiful rivers and capes and the big sand dunes and the forest and trees and it's just it's it's a wonderland for photography and for just living and i, I like how it's washington gets more credit a lot of people just skip Oregon, so it kind of is this always had this little bit of a underdog, but also kind of a little bit of a rogue. Like people are always like, "You don't write about this," you know. Like people like wouldn't write about the surfing or yeah. photograph it for a long time. Or um, same with the climbing. There weren't guidebooks for like if it was there's the better climbing in a lot of areas than there were in Colorado, but like there would be no guidebooks. It'd just be like people like passed on knowledge, you know. And so oh, it was really? like it was a just a little bit different vibe. But there's a lot of people from the Great Lakes where I'm from and then Vermont and Maine and stuff that moved to Oregon because it has kind of a similar yeah people are really friendly where I live it's like you know there's both blue collar and you know it's like fishermen and it's a it's a fishing village and it's yeah. a village and just a tourist destination but um, that's awesome so yeah it's it's a it's just a there's something about it I, I kept almost moving I've had California phone phone numbers and almost moved down to like Ventura San Barbara Ojai zone yeah. many times and almost moved to the east side the Sierra East Side, like the Bishop, that that area, but I just yeah. something always brought me back to Oregon. I don't, yeah. I don't know what it is. So huh. the yeah. Oregon Trail, you know, awesome. as they say, it's just yeah. just something about it is really magical. It feels like home. We got to do a trip up there, like a yeah. proper Oregon. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Do. Uh, you guys have yeah. plenty of place for you guys to stay. So just uh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Do us. Cool. But yeah. That's why the Huckberry crew goes. They'll like all just stay at the house and like post up in their, <laughs> in their, their trucks, trucks and, trucks shit. and campers dope. and that's stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, we would love that. Yeah, we're in. People waking up all corners of the house. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, question two yeah. at Destructo Matt. That's a sick name. That's a sick name. Good job, Matt. Uh, how often do people mix you up with Ben Moon, British climbing legend? All the time. It's been, <laughs> it's been happening for, oh man. I met Conrad Anchor in 98. I think I was on a 
climbing trip to the Red River Gorge. And he, the first thing he said, is that really your name? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but I, when I first started climbing and back in, I think it was in 96 or something, I walked into a climbing gym and the climbing gym owner like literally said, hey everybody, it's Ben Moon. And like, <laughs> oh, like literally put, showed me a climbing magazine and, uh, wait a minute, this isn't you. Oh, huh? yeah. Ben used to have dreads and he just shaved them and cut his hair like really short and he bleached his hair blonde. And so like, I, I took that, back to cut my friends at college and was like look i'm in the mags I'm just <laughs> <laughs> like, that's awesome but and then when i worked at matolas he would actually send me posters because his old brand s7 um he had some clothing and he'd be like i wish i had a name as cool as you and oh, man. <laughs> i bought i bought the benmoon.com domain name from him like 10 years ago or something oh, and yeah. and uh a few years ago he was like I should have never sold you that. I mean, oh, sold really? For like 500 bucks or something. Hell yeah. Because I should have never just sold you that. Because, like, can you put a, like, a link to my website? Because he yeah. still makes climbing gear. Those, oh, those, those really? Moon boards that, like, the, the, a lot of the gyms have. Yeah. Uh, they're called moon boards. Um, and I was like, man, I've never pretended I was you. Was, yeah. Like, if you go to my website, it's all photography and film. You know, it's like, he it's makes not, those moon boards? Yeah. That's his, oh, that's wow. his company. So, moon board. So, moon climbing. Oftentimes, people will tag me on their, like, when they're doing the moon, moon board stuff. Yeah. And I'm, I just, it's just, I it's used fun. to explain it to people, and then I just you're like, hell yeah! <laughs> At least he's yeah. a climber, and not like yeah. a Chippendale dancer or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. No, there. It's funny because there are a few other like a few other Ben Moons, and they're all doing something random. It's like really? like rugby player. There's a, a painter and a musician <laughs> in New York, and it's like I get you just gotta do a little conference, a little, <laughs> yeah, little know, moon like, conference. <laughs> <laughs> Every time there's a full moon, you guys should come together. Uh, but do a not, full moon. I mean, it's a know, really uncommon name, like certainly. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's definitely yeah. So it's a sick ass last name though. All right. Next question from I Justine. What's your favorite fridge beverage? Uh hi Justine. <laughs> That's one of my really good friends. <laughs> okay. Um uh oh man. I should should be prepared for this. Yeah, I, right. Uh I don't know. I I I really like uh I'm really into kombucha is one of my favorite things. I don't I don't drink much anymore, but if I do, it's usually I always I love June Shine, but Hell yeah. like during during COVID, that was way too accessible. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm very hydrated. So um, the reason why this came up is because her fridge is all drinks and no food. And like, yeah. it's like, that's just, that, that's my favorite way to be. It's, it's like when I go to, when I go on a trip, you know, I run into Whole Foods and I grab like all hydration stuff. Cause I just, yeah. realize, I realize it just makes you feel so much better when you're traveling. So. Oh, definitely. So you get yeah. so well, dehydrated on like a flight yeah. or something like that. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. All right, this one's from at Bird and Bear. What were the most challenging and most rewarding parts about building your home? Uh, good question. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. The rewarding part was just, you know, going from a bare piece of land to to a home. I mean, it was wild. I was living in my van in on the land, so, like, I got to walk it every day. And, like, and seeing I, – I collaborated with a couple of friends on the design part, and – it, it was just seeing, just feeling out where the spaces wanted to be and how the, how you wanted the light and the, um, I love people, but I'm definitely an introvert. So I like kind of made it where there's all these places that tuck away and hmm. kind of post up. And so it feels good with a lot of people in it. Cause you can always find a spot to yeah. post, you know, just be away. And I, I have a separate edit studio. So seeing the vision come to life and honestly framing it was amazing because a lot of my friends, like buddy who I'd used to climb with 20, 25 years prior was who, uh, who helped with the framing the most. And, and, uh, he now was, he's one of my neighbors cause he fell in love with the place. Like, um, while we, while we were building, we all had, he had a four wheel camper. Um, another friend who's used to be in the, um, his band Menomina and then he was in block party actually while we were building. Um, and he'd be like, you know, on some festival tour in Europe and then he'd come back and we'd be like, you know, putting up walls together and so like we were all but we all were in our vans in the driveway so it like the surf would be good and like my dad would be helping and all of a sudden all our nail bags would hit the floor you know our our, our tool belts would just hit the floor and he's like where are you guys going he's like we're going surfing he's like well i guess i'm going home (laughs) (laughs) and so um but the challenging parts i mean it was just i on paper it's like i'd never i'd built helped my dad build houses and i in the summers in college and high school i i definitely you know i i usually I'll help with home building. That was my, that was kind of my side, side job. And so I learned a lot, but I'd never taken anything on. And it was being the general contractor, but also during COVID I lost, you know, I had my book had just come out. 
I was working a ton with Rivian, um, doing films for them. And, and, and then all of a sudden, like, and I was doing a lot of public speaking about to do a bunch of stuff for the book and everything else. And all that went away during COVID. And so it was like, you're losing a year of work right in the middle of the house build. I was just like, oh, I basically had to like, you know, I already was doing a lot myself, but had to like hire, you know, really close friends that could just like be in the trenches with me. Cause it was like, you know, the house was almost up almost, you know, it was already up and done. And then it was like bringing, you know, making sure you could get it all the way to inspections is yeah. like there's, they say there's 10,000 decisions in the house. And I felt like I built a studio and like, a, I, I built the place that I really wanted to. I mean, um, you know, I've been lived in a lot of small houses with like one bathroom and just wanted to be able to host people yeah. that are coming through and actually like have, have people come into work and be creative there and made a creative space that people could come and just like post up and actually, you know, if you guys were, you know, coming up, you could like just take over one of the spaces and do what you needed to do. And there's that at bay and everything. And so, um, it was just <laughs> all the things you have to do to finish a house to get it for final inspection is like, there's so many little things and Damn. just getting, making all those decisions on the fly when I essentially knew nothing. <laughs> it's just like, I was, it was just, it was, I was like, well, I had like a, you know, third grade education and, uh, and building a house. And I had to get my PhD while I was doing it. You know, you just, yeah, just kind of like, so you just, I just figured out. And so that's crazy. That's the best. That's how I've done everything. I'm self-taught at almost everything I, I work. So the challenging parts were the more, most rewarding. Sounds like, yeah, <laughs> it's a powerful case. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> at Taylor Chesney, it's kind of, uh, cool. as a photographer, <laughs> what is your take on social media content of today? And how would you encourage photographers that are struggling to make a name for themselves? doing photography and videography in a place that is ruled by trending audio, viral clips, and memes? Great question, Taylor Chesney. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, I feel like one thing I've learned in, you know, 20 plus years doing this is like, you do, do the work that's meaningful to you because trends are trends and they just come and go. Um, I've seen, you know, from, and oftentimes people, if they don't stay nimble and resilient and, um, you know, if you just follow the trends, you, you tend to have, you look like everybody, everybody else and then you're, you don't have a voice, your own voice. And so I think finding your own voice and doing what is meaningful to you, doing personal projects, all of my best work, um, commercially has come from doing, um, personal projects. I mean, obviously Denali was a big one, but I did a port, I have a portrait project that is called faces that I've been doing for a long time. And that that project has gotten me really, really random odd jobs too like where it's just you know big commercial stuff where you're like how did like oh we love that stuff and it's, it's just do what do what is meaningful to you and and it's all going to work out and i was actually just on a call with um somebody from one of the social media giants and just they're asking about like, what what would it take you to do more of the like trending stuff and i was like well just you guys basically algorithms kill everything at this yeah. point so why would I like follow some trend and, and know that you're just going to kill it with an algorithm anyway? So it just anytime you stifle engagement um, and try to push whatever's big, it's like, yeah. it, it just like, it's this never ending rotating door of trying to make the, the masses happy. And so if you, if you're only trying to make everybody happy, you're never going to create great work. And what did the social giants yeah. say back to you when you told them that? They're like, uh, we don't do that. Well, <laughs> no, I, mean, I, think it's just that, I mean, they're, they're doing their thing and they're going to keep doing it. But I mean, yeah. they're just trying to understand for more of a person in, you know, who has done it for a long time and kind of seen the trends. Cause I, you know, it was, I started when it was, everybody was shooting slide. I, I, I learned on slide film, which is a terrible thing to learn on. Cause it's like really unforgiving. Um, and, and then shot that for because that's what all the magazines wanted in Patagonia. They didn't want negative film, which is so much more. There's a lot more latitude in that film. Um, and you know, shot that for five years, and then had to like transition into digital. And then it was, you know, and then everybody had to kind of learn how to shoot motion um, and essentially either know how to under, understand it or at least become a filmmaker of some sort. And then you know, social media came on board, and nobody really knew what it was. And now it's becoming this like just the quick hoping it's going to go viral and that and doing something to go viral yeah you might be successful one in a million but it's not if your feed is just all stuff trying to like yeah if it's kind of all meaningless i mean it's like 
I'm trying to figure out the balance between being curated and also like showing the real realness of life, you know? And I feel like with my book and everything, I was very raw and vulnerable, but it's like, sometimes I just don't want to, you know, show just iPhone clips all the time. You know, it's it's like stories are fine, but so yeah, I just think being true to what it's same with any brand. I feel like whenever a brand goes off on some tangent, yeah, it's like, thing they lose their plot for a while and they always come back you know and Mm -hmm. so yeah it's like finding what's true to you and true to center is is always gonna be the long game and play the long game because um trends come and go yeah well said great answer answer, yeah um well is there anything so i think that's the last question right is there anything that you got coming down the pipe that you wanted to kind of air out or any any passion projects yeah um i've been working on another book um I don't really want to talk too much about that mm-hmm. until it gets till I actually dial it, but I'm really excited about um it's been fun to start writing again. Um hopefully I'll be able to share more about that soon. Um I'd love to do a photo book at some point. Um never done that. My website's nearly ten years old and I'm <laughs> in the midst of that. It's been yeah. a torture to try to like dive through that much work. <laughs> yeah, um, that sounds insane. And so I also I feel like COVID like really made it hard it's like i feel like we're still coming out of that or it's just like hard to focus after that i feel like I'd, i used to be able to just sit in the edit bay and just grind and yeah. just like it's i'm learning how to do that again so um but yeah i i mean same with that i'm really excited about the potential for the the book being made into film but i mean the one thing about the memoir, it's it's called Denali. Um, I actually brought you guys all. Oh, did you? Yeah, I was gonna so, say I'm gonna yeah. buy one after yeah, that. Yeah, Man, so, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had some in the in the. I, I travel with them now just because it's like you meet people you're like oh I'm, yeah I'm, I'm just they're like I'll buy it and they're like no here we'll give you one. That's awesome. Um. And it's also an audio book, so I remember I heard in one of your things that somebody... That's me. Not a, <laughs> I do both. I'm, I'm, I read now. Okay. I got to keep the mind going. Mine's a... Yeah, it's a, I mean, an audio book. I'd read the Audible uh, version, and it's... Uh, uh, the audio book version, and it's um, uh, it's like seven hours, so it's not like a huge... Yeah, like a, I could bang that out in a couple like days. A, not a like 15-hour book, so, yeah. so like some of those. I wanted yeah, so to ask you. read it out? Yeah, I, re- I read it. That's I've good. always wondered, like, do you... How long do you sit in the studio and do that for? Because it's obviously seven hours. Seven hours. Uh, I mean, it was, I'm saying more so like. There's uh, no like, way that's one chop session. It up? Yeah. I think it was 30 hours total. Dang. It was like it was five five days of six hours of grinding. It was yeah. uh, with a just. I walked in the Penguin Audiobooks like studios like um, North LA and like I just I basically walked in there i was like i had no idea how to do it there's all these voice actors running around like doing all their you know like, talking about their, that's what they do for a living oh, really? and the first photo i see is michelle obama like with her like director like oh, wow. by the mic and i was like oh no pressure <laughs> <laughs> i was like what am i doing here oh, really? and um yeah i'd done a little bit of voiceover work but i didn't really you know it's just the, the other thing is i had never i'd never read the book cover to cover I we edited piece by piece by piece, you know, mm-hmm. and so when I read it uh, cover to cover, I was like, "Wow, this is Dang. this is like I said some of this stuff." I, <laughs> yeah. and I, and I edited it, and by that point, it's already yeah, it's you, out there. You can't you can't do anything. So, but yeah, it's a it's a process. Um, Can you add a little bit all? No, they you've got to keep unless there's like a typo, which they I think we found like one typo and like we wow. we had to like fix it. But um, you have a director in the other room, and it's just you by yourself just yeah. with the yeah. mic and a ipad i'd probably get darth vader for mine <laughs> just breathing all heavy the whole time how captivating that it's all slow but, but i wanted yeah. to ask too about wow. the about the feature film like what um like what control do you have once it's made like will they adapt it at all or yeah or like, yeah what, so what's your ideal scenario there so it's essentially it's all about the team you have working on it and i think i've i've a really um this the team I'm I'm pretty sure that it will make it will happen with. I feel I'm really close with the the producer and and I really clicked with the writer. So and he wants to be super collaborative. So that that feels a lot better to me. You know I, I'm such I just really love getting in the trenches with things and I know I have to step back. Cause it's I'm too close to it in some ways, but I also know that I can be a huge asset more than a lot of authors because I work you know worked in, in film photography for so long and just to help with putting it all together. Cause essentially what I, I mean, I produced a lot of things as well as directed and, um, but producing is like when you're shooting for Patagonia, you're basically the producer, the 
photographer that you're doing you're putting it all together you know figuring out how everything works and as you guys know it's just like it's kind of like you're just <laughs> winging it and figuring oh, it yeah. out and i so I, i'm really excited i think but going with a smaller production company that wants to make a really good story is is how it can matter you know and obviously there's always concessions you have to make and you have to fit it into a you know two hour ish piece and so but i'm excited for that exercise i i really have I, typically you don't when, a, when an option expires you don't necessarily get another chance and so it feels really good to have another opportunity to make that happen it sounds so. crazy to because it's such a raw story to watch your life out of body you know yeah. it sounds uh, so crazy yeah. so weird and yeah. such a powerful moment in your life too like that just sounds like such a heavy experience to go through and i think that's what you know if, if it does work out with this writer he because he had a probably one of the raw stories made about his life um i've ever watched it's like that that makes me feel better about someone like that telling yeah. the story like to, doing it justice to, to doing the scripts because it's it's a lot you know and it's it yeah they're a lot of people ask me like do you really want to do this and i was like I, I think if it could the only reason i ever did the book was because i was like if it can help someone going through you know not just like if they're going through health stuff but also you know any everybody goes through dark times and like just kind of seeing seeing how it just feeling less alone in those experiences you know and i i a lot of the motivation was because social media is such a glossy version of our lives you know it's like oftentimes only the good stuff and i yeah. just really want to be like hey we all go through this and, yeah and try to make it relatable so if, if the story can be relatable and help someone going through a hard time and you know a lot of people can relate dogs are kind of the key to your heart you know in a lot of ways like that they let people let their guard down a little bit more so yeah. like there's an ability there to tell a great story because of all the elements that are in there and um yeah so i'm i'm excited for it i've kind of you know, it's come to terms with it all. It yeah. A long time. It felt really weird at first, but I'm excited to read the book. Thanks again for bringing yeah. that. And I'm very excited to see the movie when that comes out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Stoked. Yeah. I'm going to see it in 3D, IMAX for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks it's for coming. Thanks for coming and talking to us. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, this is awesome. fun. Um, yeah. It's been, I'm glad that got it all worked out. Yeah. 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 Seriously. Too. Um, and then we'll hit you up too if we come up to Oregon because yeah. I am dying to get up there. It sounds awesome. Yeah. Please do. I mean, it's a, photo wonderland and just for for contact I mean, as far as just getting something that would feel completely different than a yeah. lot of places mm -hmm. so very down yeah. yeah well thank you very much yeah. Yeah. thanks for having me of yeah. course <laughs> there we go